Hello. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we, we now have a, a small panel with, with three uh, participants. And I am very, very, very happy that my two colleagues, uh, uh, which I know very well, we will cooperate uh, for a long time. Uh, they accepted my invitation to, to take part in that, uh, in that panel. Uh, just in a few minutes, uh, on, in one of my slides, I explain you also additionally why, why I, I have invited those two uh, people. And, uh, just uh, for, for, for the beginning, uh, let, uh, let's uh, see uh, who they are. Uh, the, the, the first one is, uh, just a moment, it's uh, Christian Hölz from Germany. Uh, she's a director of, of the mm. most uh, of the biggest and uh, most uh, well-known organization of uh, German individual investors. Uh, she's organizing organizing several big conferences. Uh, I, I, I can always remember a conference in Wiesbaden uh, uh, for organized for several years. A very 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 good conference with um, a big number of participants, uh, always very, very interesting. Yeah, I, I, I also cooperate with, with uh, Christian in, in some expert uh, groups uh, on, on the EU level. So uh, the more uh, thank you, Christian, for, uh, for coming here with a very interesting uh, presentation about uh, a wire card. And uh, the second uh, is Andy and Agaten Agatangelo, uh, who, who is a, a founder and uh, chief and main organizer of Transparency Task Force. This is a very international organization with, uh, uh, with participants from all parts of the globe, even from America, East Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, etc. <laughs> Uh, I uh, I have that uh, the privilege to, to to be the ambassador of of a transparency task force, for, uh, and uh, Andy will will have uh, uh, some discussion uh, why corporate governance isn't working and how to remedy that. Uh, so now uh, I will start with my presentation. Uh, I am I am very sorry that uh, I I won't be able to to be with you uh, for, for the for our whole panel because uh, now uh, after that I, I will have a visit at my uh, doctor you know, with my post COVID uh, uh, recovering uh, but uh, and and, and the Christian they, they are well prepared so they will continue the uh, the presentation and uh, just before I leave. Uh, so we will have a uh, possibility of, uh, for discussion. So, uh, Christian and Andy, if you have any questions to my presentation, please uh, uh, go on after, just after I finish. Well, uh, so I, 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 I can, I, I will now go to, to the beginning of the presentation. Yes. Uh, this is about uh, European uh, sources, e European Union sources of corporate governance. Uh, because uh, we uh, now it is a very popular topic, uh, very often mentioned, uh, uh, but uh, it's interesting to, to, to look, uh, to, to see how it started, how it started with, uh, uh, with corporate governance as such, and then uh, transformed or uh, was, had been enriched with uh, other uh, uh, elements of, of uh, reporting, uh, like uh, non-financial uh, reporting, like uh, climate uh, changes, etc., ESG, uh, which is broader than uh, corporate governance because ESG includes, uh, the G includes corporate governance. Uh, so, uh, uh, I would like to mention just two sentences uh, for, for, for the start. Uh, the, the first one was originally the European uh, Commission website, uh, and it was uh, the harmonization of the rules relating to company law and corporate governance, as well as accounting and auditing, is essential 
for creating a single market for financial services and products. Uh, this is a very important sentence. Now um, it, it disappeared from, 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 from the website of, of, the, of the commission because that, that, that web, website has been uh, rebuilt uh, very seriously, but uh, it's very important. So, so that's why I start with that uh, uh, sentence because it's harmonization of the rules. Uh, all the rules, company law, accounting, auditing, etc. that the uh, financial market, if, if we uh, talk about financial institutions, uh, for, for creating single market for, for the whole European Union. And the second uh, sentence, uh, which is uh, much older, even older than, than the, the, the first one, is the sentence of Sir Adrian Cadbury, who is well known as a, for, well, as a founder of, of modern corporate governance. Uh, let, let, us, uh, let, let us say uh, like that. The foundation of any structure of corporate governance is disclosure. Openness is the basis of public confidence in the corporate system. And funds will flow to centers of economic activity that inspire trust. This is also a very important sentence because it, it tells us why we are uh, we are dealing, we are talking about corporate governance, why it is so important for us. Because it has it, it has also a very important economic factor. If there is a trust, uh, the uh, capital market, so the, the investor will 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 come, will go to that market with the investor money, will uh, will develop that, that mark. So those are two, two centers that, that I always repeat and I, I will always remember as a real uh, start of corporate governance and a real um, uh, explanation of why, why it is so important. Well, the first step, uh, starting from, from the modern time, because we, we could uh, find some sources of corporate governance very, very long ago. But uh, when it, uh, it started more, uh, more officially with, with some documents. So the first uh, real document was Cadbury report that Sir Adrian Cadbury was a uh, leading person uh, working on, on, uh, on that report. And uh, it, uh, it gave some guidelines, uh, but on a comply or explain basis. And this is the principle which is governing corporate governance all the time. So we can follow corporate governance guidelines or corporate gover governance principles. They are not compulsory, but if you don't follow them, you have to explain why and when you will start to follow them because they are so important for, 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 for all particip participants, all market participants. Uh, so th this was the, 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 the first uh, documentary uh, start. Uh, and uh, in following years, uh, some other EU countries also prepared uh, such guidelines. Uh, this, this was, uh, this was the, the first phase with guidelines, uh, not uh, corporate guide codes as such, but only soft, very soft guidelines. But when in the 2000, uh, uh, the, the Enron, WorldCom, and, and uh, several others, uh, uh, that financial uh, crisis resulting from, from that, uh, so uh, it uh, started to move uh, much quicker uh, and even more seriously. So the, this was uh, well, the, the, the second phase uh, started in 2001. And why I mentioned here Sarbanes Oxley Act, uh, it's, it, it's not EU, EU uh, because it's uh, it's US, uh, United, United States uh, law. Uh, because very often uh, I hear that this was the first corporate governance regulation. No, it was it was not a corporate governance regulation. It is a regulation mainly on auditors. And in somewhere there, there are some, some uh, how auditors should cooperate with board members. So this is the only element of real corporate governance there. But uh, a real start uh, with uh, corporate governance 
clothes was a little bit later, not, not, not so late, uh, well, also in 2002. It was uh, the German corporate governance code uh, uh, in Germany. Uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, I like very, very much that, that construction because it, 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 uh, it, uh, there was a part, uh, some citation from uh, uh, law. Uh, capital market law. There were some uh, some uh, principles that that should be followed, and some uh, suggestions that could be followed. Uh, so this was a very very, very complex uh, regulation. And uh, of course, where we can remember Cadbury report, which which has uh, transformed uh, then uh, in the uh, corporate governance code uh, in UK. But uh, in Poland, we also were, were rather rather quick with that because in 2002, a uh, code of best practice was uh, um, uh, uh, was prepared by, by, by a group of wise men and was uh, officially taken up uh, by the Warsaw Stock Exchange. I had a honor there then uh, to be a member of supervisory board of, of Warsaw Stock Exchange. So I also worked with that issue. And that, that uh, you, you can see the explanation why, why I have invited Christian from Germany and Andy from UK. Uh, the more I, I, I am happy you, you, uh, you are here uh, with us. Well, uh, how it uh, developed in Europe, uh, in European Union. So there, uh, in the beginning, there were some, some recommendations. Uh, in 2004, it was December, as I, as I remember, um, uh, the recommendation about remuneration regime regime in uh, listed companies. Uh, the, those were the first uh, guidelines uh, from the hints how it should be organized uh, in the um, spirit of corporate governance. The second one, just a few months later, uh, it was uh, another recommendation uh, uh, for uh, how non-executive directors should uh, should do their job. Uh, non, uh, by non-executive directors, we, we don't understand both non-executive non -executive directors in a single uh, uh, in one tier board. Uh, uh, UK uh, uh, system uh, where, where we have one board of directors, uh, but uh, it also concerns uh, supervisory board members, uh, which are uh, because in uh, the Germany, in Poland, uh, in the continental, continental system, we have two tier system where there is a management board and a supervisory board. So uh, the, the, those recommendations uh, uh, deal mainly with those non-executive directors. Uh, a few year later, a few years later, uh, after uh, some revision of of, uh, of current uh, practices and of current development, new recommendation uh, in two thousand uh, in two thousand nine two new uh, recommendations uh, appeared. Uh, the first one was about remuneration in financial services. And the second one about remuneration in listed companies. As you can expect it, uh, requirements for uh, concerning remuneration in financial services uh, are more, more strict than in other listed companies. Uh, because uh, you see, financial uh, services are uh, very important for for all the, uh, um, uh, for everything what 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 we deal with uh, on, on on the market. But a little bit earlier, in two thousand six, um, there was the first uh, directive uh, about, uh, on statutory audits of annual accounts, uh, uh, with uh, that mentioned audit committee. Uh, so uh, in every, in, in not also in the listed companies, but uh, what what we are dealing uh, today uh, with is uh, listed companies. So uh, it was uh, uh, the first regulation uh, telling us that uh, 
at uh, a regulation, not a recommendation as, as, as before, uh, that told us that uh, uh, enlisted companies in the boards of directors or in supervisory boards, uh, there, there should be an audit committee who, who one of, of its tasks uh, was uh, cooperation with external, external auditors, but one of the, of, of the tasks. Then uh, there was a green paper about corporate governance in financial institutions and remuneration policies. And then uh, directive in 2010, new directive uh, called CRD3, uh, uh, about uh, which taught also about supervisory review. No, so not, not only how they, they should be uh, prepared, but how they should also be reviewed and then checked whether they are executed. Uh, so a review of remuneration policies. Then a green paper uh, in the listed corporate governance in listed companies was announced. I, I am very happy uh, that it was announced at the corporate governance co conference in Warsaw, in Poland. Uh, in uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, I could uh, also be more uh, involved uh, with that. Uh, then, uh, uh, oh, well, okay. Um, uh, there came a directive in 2013. There was another directive on the annual financial statements. And look at uh, the Article 19, some point point eight, etc. Uh, that uh, required that uh, uh, in at the management report there should be, but only were appropriate uh, information about uh, non-financial key performance indicators relevant to the particle business. What uh, does it mean when appropriate? So if a company felt that it was important for, 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 for its business, and the company should report that. Uh, but a year later, there was another directive uh, which amended the, the, the previous one, uh, and it, it introduced uh, some obligation for, uh, for, for uh, including non-financial statements in, uh, in the management report. And it, it became obligatory for large undertaking. Over 500 employees uh, uh, as minimum. And uh, that there should be information about environment, uh, social employee matters, uh, human rights, anti-corruption, bribery, et cetera. Uh, and for large undertaking, uh, undertakings, it became obligatory, compulsory. But uh, for uh, uh, and also and in Article Twenty, uh, corporate governance statement appeared, uh, and uh, it should include description of the diversity policy. Uh, the, it was, uh, but, but it, it's written in a proportional way. So small uh, and medias, uh, medium enterprises are not obliged to, to, to provide such information, uh, but they, they could, of course. Uh, but that corporate governance statement should include information about uh, diversity policy or an explanation as to why no such policy is applied. So you can see uh, again the comply or explain principle. Then very, very important uh, directive, which I call as the first uh, directive uh, on corporate governance, dealing with corporate governance. And I am also very proud that uh, I, I, I took part in, in the works of on that directive in a working group in Brussels, and then uh, uh, with implementation uh, uh, that directive in Polish uh, into Polish uh, company law, uh, and the, 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 the SRD one, uh, the, the first part, uh, the, the first the, the directive, uh, it uh, was in two thousand seven, at and touched the general meetings of shareholders. Uh, it, this is a very important part of corporate governance because uh, this is 
to, 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 be, to be frank, uh, this is the only real possibility of shareholders to meet management board, supervisory board members, so also to, to discuss with uh, uh, with the management of, of the company and to um, to specify the the, the most important uh, strategy and directions where a company should go. And of course, uh, for another direction, uh, so the most important information from the management to uh, shareholders. Uh, Ten years later, uh, came uh, another directive, uh, SRD2, so a directive which amended the, the, the first directive, but not only amended, but a, a lot of new requirements, uh, new new uh, guide guidelines, new new uh, proposals have been included there. The first one is about identification of shareholders. So how the company can know who really are the shareholders? Because uh, you, you see, in the listed companies. Uh, shareholding changes every day, uh, and uh, but sometimes companies would like to uh, to, to know at least uh, what are the groups uh, of, of uh, holders, what what their interests are, etc., etc. That the second part of a very important transmission of information. So not only during uh, the general meetings, but for the whole years, how to how to uh, inform the, the shareholders about the current development, the current corporate governance events in the company. Uh, another part, uh, the further going facilitation of exercise of shareholders' rights. Uh, but uh, it's it's also also a very important part about proportionality and transparency of costs. Uh, uh, and I, I think that this is the, the most uh, difficult uh, part of, of the directive, uh, how to deal with third country intermediaries. Because uh, when, when you look at the flow of information from the company to, to, to the shareholder, it goes through the chain of uh, intermediaries. When those intermediaries are, are in European Union, uh, so they have, uh, they can have some obligations uh, from uh, on, on the basis of MIFID uh, directive. But if they are outside of Europe, so they are not obliged to, to follow MIFID. So here we have only some some uh, sentences uh, talking now uh, that uh, the EU intermediaries should organize uh, such a co cooperation with third country intermediaries. So that that flow of information is not broken. It's not easy task. Um, there are some 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 flows uh, here, but it at least shows the direction uh, it should go in. Uh, and uh, another chapter was added here: remuneration policy and reports, uh, and a uh, very important part related party transactions. Uh, but uh, I, I would, I would. Uh, this is not not uh, not a, a, a really chronological a chronological order because now we are coming back to two, 2014, when uh, there was another recommendation of of Commission, the European Commission, uh, on, about quality of the corporate governance reporting on the basis comply or explain. Uh, and what uh, what uh, we remember, what company companies remember, is the second part of, of that, uh, which is uh, showed here: quality of explanations in case of departure from a company. And this is uh, required by, by, by several uh, stock exchanges uh, in, in Poland. It is required by, by, by the Warsaw Stock Exchange also. Uh, so now, if the company departed from the code, from the whole code, or from a specific uh, principle from the code, it should explain in what manner uh, it was uh, done, wh what, were, what were the reasons for such a departure. And there's the, 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 another question is also very often forgotten, how the decision was taken. 
within the company to depart from that part of the core. Uh, and when this de departure is limited in time, so information, at least uh, provisional information, when the company intends to, to come back to that, uh, to that uh, principle. And what is uh, very, very important, uh, I, I also uh, stress that, uh, that importance of that last sentence, the measure taken instead, especially when we have a, a big international, uh, international uh, corporations. Uh, that are listed, uh, for example, mother companies listed in the uh, US or UK or, or somewhere else, and the, the daughter company is listed in, in Poland, uh, the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Um, uh, and very often in such a big uh, structure, the, the, the code of uh, corporate governance uh, applied for the whole, whole network, uh, for all the companies in, in, in the group. So sometimes they do not follow, and uh, sometimes it's impossible to follow exactly the the, the codes uh, the code uh, applied uh, at the Warsaw Stock Exchange. So sometimes there is such a company listed in Warsaw has to declare that it does not follow exactly the, the principle of the uh, Wars of, of of the Warsaw Stock Exchange uh, corporate governance, but. Uh, the, uh, it is following another principle which is very simple, uh, similar uh, in the, the desk, uh, in that uh, task. So uh, it's quite, uh, in fact, it is following the corporate governance principle here. But just uh, let, 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 let's come back to, to the first part of, of that uh, uh, recommendation. It tells us, uh, tell us about the quality of corporate governance statements when the, the, the code is followed. So the company should not also inform uh, about the, the, the cases it does not follow the, the, those principles, but it should explain at least briefly, at least briefly how, is, uh, how the company is understanding the corporate governance code and uh, how it is following that code. This is very, very important and uh, very often overlooked by, by, by company. Well, uh, another, uh, another uh, part uh, which I would like to, to discuss shortly uh, here, it's a problem with the ESG rating. Because we have a lot of such ratings uh, several uh, uh, from stock exchanges apply some some uh, some uh, uh, indexes indices uh, based on on that and uh, just uh, lately uh, Warsaw Stock Exchange all, also applied uh, introduced such such, uh, such an index uh, well i am happy that such an index uh, has been has been implemented uh, here but uh, I am very disappointed with some 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 flaws of of of, of that uh, index because roughly speaking, uh, the sixty biggest companies included in that that index, uh, we have a big uh, twenty for twenty biggest companies, uh, and big big forty for next forty biggest companies. So together, those two indexes, uh, two indices. Uh, so all the, the, those companies that are in those two indices are ex definition included in this ESG rating. And their participation in, in the rating may be reduced uh, when uh, the ESG rating is low. But that ESG rating is rather opaque for investors because they, they don't, don't, don't don't have a possibility to, to know what are the real criteria applied in this in this rating. Uh, the company can can know that, but the company has to pay uh, to, to get such, such information. Uh, and uh, if the the ESG rating is very very extremely low, the participants of of, of that company can be reduced, but 
no less than to 60 percent of the of the of its original uh, participation in the index. And uh, another factor which which can lower the the, the participants is a corporate governance reporting. But the possible reductions is even smaller because if the company completely does not follow corporate governance or if, if the company is lying about uh, in, in, in its uh, reports, the uh, share in the index uh, may be reduced only to 85%. When you multiply those two factors, you, you will receive uh, that the company which is completely against ESG. The complete the com company which uh, completely neglects uh, corporate governance, it still remains in that ESG index with the share of fifty one percent. So, in my opinion, such such a company could be immediately removed from the index, but it it still does. But it's not not the problem only in in, in Warsaw Stock Exchange because let 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 look look let's see that uh, ESMA uh, letter uh, sent uh, this year in January this year uh, about the, the problem with, with ESG rating and uh, and told us that there's a the risk of greenwashing. Uh, there's a risk of capital misall misallocation because investors who believe they are investing uh, uh, in ESG friendly companies, in fact, they, they are investing in, 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 in quite different companies. There, there, there's a risk of conflict of interest, uh, product mis-selling, etc. Uh, so, the, the last slide, uh, I would like uh, because I when I look at the, the, the development of a corporate governance, sometimes I, I'm disappointed with with with, uh, with, uh, uh, with directions it is going to or is not going to. Uh, but always, um, always I, I say, well, we can, we should do what we are able to do. So we should try, uh, don't stop our efforts. And this is one one of such uh, such a movement. In Poland, we have uh, such a contest uh, 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 that started uh, since uh, in, it started in 2006 uh, and reviewed the uh, annual reports of 2005. Uh, the contest for the best annual report organized by the Institute of Accountants and, uh, and Taxes in Polish Institute Rachunkowości i Podatków. Um, I am the member of, of the jury from, from the very beginning, uh, and uh, last year, uh, last year, uh, from the, the, the pilot edition was uh, in uh, 2019, uh, and that, that pilot edition was uh, for, for big 20 companies, uh, were in the main, uh, because, uh, well, uh, we have three groups of criteria uh, in that context. The first one is uh, a financial report of uh, how it apply, apply the international uh, rules of reporting. The second part is management report. And the third part was so-called uh, colored report. So, uh, so uh, the, 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 the book printed by, by the companies as a kind of adver advertisement of, of the company. But uh, in 2019, we've started a pilot edition uh, where is, uh, additionally, we've, uh, we have looked at the corporate governance reports as such. And last year in 2020, uh, the, the structure of, of, the, of the criteria of the whole contest has been changed. So. For the financial report, you can obtain 40 points. For management statement as such, without corporate governance, you can get uh, 30 points. And for corporate governance statement, you can get 30 points. So the, the big, big share in the, 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 the big price is about corporate governance statement. And uh, you see, we, we have some some quite uh, quite nice uh, experience from from that pilot edition and from from that uh, last year edition. Uh, so uh, I, I I really strongly believe it's a good way of promoting corporate governance and corporate governance reports. So uh, 
uh, I will finish my presentation. Then uh, uh, before 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 I will have to leave, uh, Christian and, and Andy, please uh, give your comments if you have so, uh, or if you have some questions to to to, to me, I, I I will be happy to answer them. And then I, I will leave you uh, for for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. If it's okay, I would start. Yes, of First course. of all, um, thank you so much, Christoph, for having me, uh, for having me invited to this conference. Um, it's always a pity that um, we cannot meet uh, in person and exchange in person. It's um, I'm still not fully used to talking to a screen and not seeing the audience, um, but I will do my best and. Uh, Thank you again um, wholeheartedly for the invite. Uh, thank you also very much for this excellent overview of um, EU developments. Um, that was such a rich and um, uh, well, extensive presentation on what has happened over the last uh, uh, 17 or 18 years uh, at EU level. I will show you later that all these efforts at EU level have not managed to save their purpose, at least not in Germany. Um, so I very much like that uh, you started with um, the point on harmonization of corporate governance rules. So my, my first question, I have three questions to you. I had put up hundreds, but I will focus on three, uh, would be, um, uh, what is your view? Wouldn't that bear the risk that um, we would get, um, we would, uh, this would lead to minimum standardization? Um, and um, uh, counterbalance some efforts uh, member states have already achieved in their own local corporate, uh, corporate governance system. Um, you mentioned the SRD2, the Shareholder Rights Directive, as a very important part of corporate governance. I fully subscribe to that um, uh, because it strengthens the, the powers of shareholders to exercise their uh, their rights and their influence uh, at the general meeting, which for me is the highest um, uh, body of, uh, of, uh, of a company. Um, you be, will be, I'm sure, well aware of the sustainable corporate governance consultation of the EU Commission that has, has just been closed a couple of weeks ago, in which the Commission um, well, shows a bit of a, uh, an intent to shift from a shareholder um, approach to a more stakeholder empowerment. And I would really uh, like to get your views on how you perceive, would perceive this. Um, would it really make sense to uh, include uh, stakeholders, to empower stakeholders more than uh, shareholders um, or in the same way than shareholders and my last one is a very uh, special one but I'm not I know you are the expert on this and so I'm asking you this one as well because I'm really personally interested in this one um, uh, shareholder rights directive 2 and we work together on its implementing regulation uh, with the EU commission um, wanted to facilitate the, access, uh, the, the exchange of information between um, issuers and investors. Um, we see now it doesn't really work uh, properly. Um, at least this general meeting season still shows a lot of flaws. Um, my question is, uh, do you see a need for a public oversight of intermediaries uh, for transmitting the information between issuers and investors? For example, in Germany, there is no BaFin, our national competent authority is not responsible for this. ESMA doesn't feel responsible for it. Um, there is not really someone who is overseeing um, the the exchange of information if uh, between issuers and investors. What would be your view on this one? Yes. Thank you. I know it's a lot of questions, but I'm really interested. And I'm sorry, Andy, I'm monopolizing a bit. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, Andy, you would like to ask your questions, or, or you, you prefer that I uh, I start with answering Christian questions? I, I think Christian's questions are excellent. Please do respond to those, and then, then I'll chip in after that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the the, the first question about. Uh, 
uh, the danger of uh, um, uh, going into the, the direction of mini, minimal standards only. Well, this is a very, very, very difficult uh, question because uh, <coughs> the countries, uh, the, the EU members, uh, differ very, very much between these. So it is, it is, uh, it would be very, very extremely difficult uh, even to try to to provide a uh, universal uh, code for, for for the company. So we should we should go with with those minimum standards. For, uh, for the whole European Union. But we, sh we should work on developing those minimum standards in each country to, so that they, they, they are not only those minimum standards uh, provided for, for the whole uh, union, Euro European Union, but they, 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 uh, they are broader than those minimum standards. And we, we should cooperate in, uh, cooperate in developing those uh, maybe sometime uh, more universal, more uh, developed uh, standards. This is uh, the, my, my idea how it should go, uh, in, in what direction uh, and how it should uh, be uh, done. As for, uh, for uh, SRD2, uh, and the, those uh, works on uh, of European Commission about sustainability and empowering more stakeholders than uh, shareholders. Well, it uh, empowering stakeholders more than shareholders. It would be too far reaching. But I always repeat that corporate governance. Uh, uh, I don't understand uh, corporate governance in a in a very narrow sense. As, a, as relations between management and shareholders, but uh, as a very, very broad sense that this is uh, the, the whole set of regulations, are regulations, the law, uh, regulations in law and self-regulations. So the, 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 the soft law concerning all the aspects of uh, uh, contact uh, of the company with with, other, with with outside world. So not only shareholders, but inside employees, uh, for example, but outside uh, social environment, uh, clients, uh, cooperation with other companies, uh, environment. Uh, so it is very important. So always, we, uh, uh, when, when, when you are a member of, for example, if you are a member of the supervi supervisory board, and I, ha I have some experience because, because I was a member of the supervisory board of, of the Warsaw, Warsaw Stock Exchange, also at the Citibank uh, in, in Warsaw. And uh, I always repeat that we should take into account all the interests of stakeholders. It does not mean that those interests should prevail the interests of shareholders. But if we uh, decide that, well, we don't take into account that requirement of stakeholders, we should exactly know why it, the, the, the more, more important are uh, the requirements of our shareholders. But we should try to explain the shareholders that uh, taking into account those other interests are in their own economic business interest. Because if the clients are, are happy, their company will, 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 will develop, the, 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 they will receive higher, higher dividends, etc. etc. Uh, so it should be taken into account. And uh, but, but the real good equilibrium is very very much required. As for for your third question, well, um, I've I've been at that expert group a little bit longer than you because because you you became a member of uh, in, in the final part of, of our work there. Uh, but you see, it was very very difficult discussion, but. It's, the topic is extremely difficult. 
Well, uh, when you look at the, uh, the first uh, directive of 2007, you can find the statement that in a year, or even in a half year, I don't remember exactly, the European Commission will prepare guidelines for flow of information, including non uh, outside uh, uh, intermediaries, non-EU intermediaries. And the, until now, there's no, no such guideline because it would be too difficult to, to prepare some, some, such guidelines uh, explaining all the pro problems with, with those uh, uh, external intermediaries uh, who are not obliged to fo follow our, our rules, our regulations. So the only new statement appeared in the uh, SRD2, but it's also very, very vague. Uh, and uh, when we, we were working at that, that, that expert group, we all, we, we all knew that uh, we cannot give a binding regulation, on, only some, some guidelines, some how to, how to force, or, uh, not force, but uh, uh, how to organize a cooperation with those external uh, intermediaries that the flow of information uh, will not break. It's very difficult. Uh, I don't believe that uh, any kind of supervision by, by ESMA or, or what, what would help, but some kind of, of study how it is? Uh, what what are what are strong power, uh, strong sides of, of that uh, cooperation, and uh, what are uh, weak uh, sides of that cooperation? I think it is, it is important to 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 perform such a study, so we can um, have some some new ideas how to how to deal with that big really big problem. I I, I hope I answered your your your, your all questions. So, Andy, yes, go on with your Thank questions. You. Thank you. I, I have just one, and it's a very general question, Christoph. Uh, but before I go to the question, may I also thank you very much indeed for inviting me to be part of your, your discussion today. It's a very important discussion that we are having because failures in corporate governance affect all of us in so, so many ways. But my question is of a more uh, fundamental nature, and this is about the purpose of an organization. Um, I believe that there is, um, there are significant problems within the uh, system of business around the world because organizations see their purpose as simply being to uh, maximize profit in the short term. So I would like to hear your thoughts about the ideas, for example, that are coming out from the business roundtable in the United States uh, and for many other places as well about the idea that organizations should define their purpose being to serve society, to serve community. Um, if you like to try to take the purpose of an organization to a higher level. And, and I put this question to you, Christoph, because it is my firm belief that if an organization simply sees its purpose as being to maximize profit in the short term, it will always default back to this. It will always behave in accordance with that, uh, that reason for existence, that raison d'etre. So it is almost like trying to defy gravity to get an organization to behave properly if it sees its purpose as being profit maximization. So a very general comment, but please share with us what you feel about the importance of organizations getting to grips with what their true purpose ought to be. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very, very, very big and very important question. And not only co connected with corporate governance, well, but also, also with et uh, business ethics. Yes. And I, I can remember when uh, several years ago, uh, I started to, to provide uh, some courses on business ethics for candidates for uh, uh, stockbrokers. 
uh, this was this was uh, also a very important part of, of, of my my uh, lectures, uh, not lectures uh, but discussions with uh, with participants, mm. and I showed uh, several examples where, well, uh, I started with something like that. If you have one business to, to, to one deal to, 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 to perform. You can cheat your, your partner. In short term, you win because you will have a perfect uh, profit, etc. But your partner uh, will feel yes. <laughs> so you will never enter in any other business with that partner. If you are if you are cheating everybody, uh, or um, um, not, not so strongly, uh, if you are uh, thinking only about your part of business, so you, 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 you can have some, some deals in short term, but no longer. So you, you will lose your business after some years. Your company will not develop as much as it could develop if you felt not only the short-term profit, but long-term profit, long-term existence of the company. Yes. Uh, a very, very practical, well, uh, so when you ask about serving obligation with serving society, community, I wouldn't go so far because it, it, would, it would be difficult to, to put such an obligation because shareholders, they invest their money. They, they invest their money to, to, to have a profit from, from, from that, that money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have I, I always ask uh, have a question: Why uh, shareholders should um, uh, should have in mind the society community when several other people neglect that? Uh, but if they 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 uh, they do understand that uh, maximization of profit uh, in short term <laughs> is very it's very short uh, <laughs> horizon uh, of our uh, activities. We don't live a year or two or three. We, we, we are living longer and longer. Uh, I am now almost 70 uh, and I, I intend to live uh, some, uh, some more uh, years also. Uh, so we should, our perspective of life is not a quarter of, of a year. It's not a year, it's not a five year term, it's long period. If you want to, to develop uh, our, our business, so we don't start it for, 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 for three years. We, we hope it will, uh, it will, uh, <laughs> will, be, will be going for, for much longer period. Uh, maybe if, 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 it, if it is a family company, uh, we hope that our, our children, our, our grandchildren will, will continue that business. So if we think only in short term, we don't, we cannot achieve such a name. So okay. I think uh, um, no obligation to serve society, but uh, uh, having in mind that if we don't, don't do that, we, we will uh, very soon lose our business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. I enjoyed listening to your answer. I really did. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I believe now, Christoph, the plan is for me to pick up from here, uh, if that is correct. And, yeah, and I will. Good. Thank you very much. I wish to thank you again for inviting me to be part of your event today. It is uh, already a very enjoyable and educational uh, session for me. So um, I will attempt to um, talk everybody through a number of quite general ideas and Christiana is going to be picking up on those ideas and focusing on more specific matters. So please expect my session to be quite general, to be quite um, fundamental 
in its uh, in it is in its nature but i still hope it could be quite interesting for all of you i'm going to be trying to uh, share my screen and i will use my screen to uh, talk you through some specific uh, ideas first of all of course it makes sense for me to introduce everybody to myself and the transparency task force uh, we are an international organization we have approximately 3,000 members, just over 3,000 members around the world. We are a not-for-profit. We are a certified social enterprise, which means we are constitutionally obliged to work towards our mission and our values. And as you can see on the screen, our mission is to promote ongoing reform of the financial sector so that it serves society better. So of course you will immediately see everybody, there is a focus on the financial sector, but equally because the financial sector permeates into every part of the world of business, our interest is indirectly in relation to all businesses of all kinds in all parts of the world. So that is our mission to promote ongoing reform of the financial sector so that it serves society better. And our, our vision, what we are working towards, is to build a highly respected international and influential institution that helps to ensure consumers are treated by, fairly by the financial sector. So that's what we are all about. My next, uh, my next piece is just to emphasize the international nature of our work. Although we are UK based, we have very quickly become a, uh, a community around the world. So we have uh, we have many Zoom meetings, many events and so on and so forth. And we have uh, what we call TTF USA. I think we have approximately 350 members across the United States. And every few months we have a quarterly uh, Zoom meeting as well as various other meetings as well. We have TTF Asia which is mostly made up of people in Hong Kong and Singapore, with a few people in India, but not many. In Europe, we have, I think, 400 plus members. Of course, Europe is of enormous interest to us. Um, I, I do not wish to uh, think about Brexit. It is heartbreaking. Uh, but I do wish to say that not every British person is pleased to be outside of Europe. So let me make that point very clearly. And Europe remains a very, very important part of our, of our work. We also have TTF Australia, very, very exciting. In fact, because of Zoom, we quite often have people in both hemispheres joining our meetings, which is truly exciting. We also have Canada and we also have South Africa. Now, going back to Europe, I should mention this, and I'm so proud. Um, uh, several years ago, I had a telephone conversation with uh, Guillaume Presch, who runs uh, Better Finance, and we, the Transparency Task Force, I'm so proud have become associate members of Better Finance. And I'm trying to, in a way, grow the Transparency Task Force into something like Better Finance for the UK and for other parts of the world. And occasionally I say to Guillaume and the others at Better Finance, the world needs better finance, not just Europe. The whole world needs better finance. And I will always do what I can to try to make that happen. The next piece I will talk about is our ambassadors. Uh, our ambassadors, we have approximately 300 of them. These are very, very important people. These are individuals who are particularly well aligned to our mission and our values and our, and our principles. Uh, we have um, ambassadors in many, many parts of the world. Uh, we only have one in Poland, and it, it will not surprise you who it is. It is Christoph himself. We are, of course, very, very proud to have Christoph. As our, as our ambassador in Poland, we are always looking for more. And um, I will give some slides to the organizers to circulate. And through that, people will have the option to contact me about this particular matter or anything else that I'll be speaking about. So I hope that is enough so that you all get a feel for what the Transparency Task Force is. Just think of us as a collaborative campaigning community right across the world that wants the financial industry to behave itself, to actually not break the rules, to uh, keep out of trouble, to not wreck the global economy, uh, and so on and so forth. 
I'm now going to uh, turn the clock all the way back to 1914, because in 1914, this gentleman, I hope you can see my screen, yeah? This gentleman, uh, Justice Louis Brandes, wrote a book. Now, it is quite likely you may never have heard about him. And even if you have, you may not think of the connection between Justice Louis Brandes and the topic of corporate governance. But let me tell you this. In my opinion, pretty much all the corporate governance that we need can be achieved if we operate the principle that Justice Louis Brandes wrote about in 1914. So let me tell you about the book and let me tell you about the principle. And you will, of course, see why I am so uh, keen to uh, promote this particular principle. The book I'm talking about was written in 1914. Uh, you will see by the length of this Wikipedia page that Justice Louis Brandes did a lot in his life, a great deal, including getting onto the face of, uh, uh, onto the cover of Time magazine. But in 1914, Justice Louis Brandes wrote a book. Uh, the book is entitled um, Other People's Money and How the Bankers Use It. I will just repeat that. Other People's Money and How the Bankers Use It. It is a good book. Despite the fact that it is old, the principles within it are still very, very sound. And there is one particular point that is hyper significant to the topic of corporate governance. And that point is this, and you will find it in his book. It is the first place this point was ever made. He made the point, this gentleman and ladies, he made the point, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I love this. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. It is such a powerful point. It has a lifetime's wisdom in just one simple sentence. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. So if I may, please, I will speak to this point. Um, the reason I run the Transparency Task Force, the reason we are dedicated to driving up the levels of transparency in financial services is because we embrace fully the idea that sunlight is the best disinfectant. People tend to misbehave when they think they are not being seen or not being watched. So there is, of course, a very close correlation between transparency and truthfulness and trustworthiness. So I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that where we have disclosure, we are probably have good conduct. Where we don't have, where we don't have um, good disclosure, we probably do not have good corporate conduct. So we must challenge ourselves. What is there that is currently in the ecosystem of business that is in the shadows, that is in the dark, that is opaque? Because that is where the problems are. Yeah, the opacity, the, uh, the shadows, the darkness, where we cannot see what is happening, that is where the problems are. So my thoughts about corporate governance always take me first and foremost to 1914 and the book Other People's Money and How the Bankers Use It by Justice Louis Brandes. Please think about this. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. Sunlight really, truly is the best disinfectant. The, the second part person I'm going to refer to goes even further back than that. Even further back than that. Of course, you will have heard of Charles Darwin. Everybody knows about Charles Darwin. Everybody knows about the origin of species. Yeah, the book that was all about evolution. But you may be wondering, yes, but what has this got to do with corporate governance? I will explain. In my opinion, the wisdom inside the book on the origin of species helps understand the issues that corporate governance is trying to deal with. My point is this, ladies and gentlemen, if we think of corporate governance as a solution to a problem, the good place to start is to think about the problem. What is the problem that we are trying to deal with? 
And let me tell you what I think. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that the problem we are trying to deal with is two words, human nature. Allow me to contextualize this. You see, the reason we are here today is because of survival of the fittest. We, the human race, exists because for millennia, for tens of thousands of and millions of years, we have evolved to survive. Survival of the fittest, by definition, explains why we are here. I don't mean why we are here talking about corporate governance. I mean why we are here in terms of why we have survived to exist. And my point is this, at the heart of survival is the notion of keeping yourself alive, keeping your immediate family alive. Surviving life death means being selfish. It means looking after your needs. It means doing what it takes to get by, minute to minute, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. So ladies and gentlemen, I have a phrase and the phrase is, progress begins with realism. The phrase progress begins with realism speaks to the idea that if we really want to improve things, we must be very, very honest with each other. And my point is that when all is said and done, we are a species. We are animals, some more civilized than others, but essentially we are driven by the same survival instincts that Charles Darwin wrote about all those years ago in On the Origin of Species. And if we were not successful at surviving, we would not be here today. So I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to think about corporate governance as a solution to the problem of people being fundamentally self-interested and recognizing that the idea of being self-interested is hardwired into all of us to one degree or another and that in and of itself the idea of doing well for yourself, surviving, getting by, is not fundamentally wrong. We create a sense of right and wrong because we look at it from the perspective of morals and ethics. And of course, if we choose to live in a civilized society, we can think of survival in that way. But my point is this, we must assume that people are driven by very, very strong human nature characteristics. Now, here we are today in 2021. We do not think need to think day to day about life and death and survival as a species. We think about other things. So I'm now going to introduce another player into this explanation that you've probably never thought of in the context of corporate governance before, but you may be very, very familiar with his work. So I am now talking about Abraham Maslow. Abraham Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a very famous explanation of the way people behave and why people behave the way that people behave. He wrote in 1943 a paper, uh, the, a, a theory of human motivation. And he expressed this here, theory of human motivation by way of the pyramid, which you probably cannot see, but do not worry. I will be circulating a link to all of these web pages. I hope they may be of some interest to you. Now, there is only really uh, one or uh, two levels in the pyramid of needs that are of interest to us today, because the very base level is uh, physiological needs, i.e. eating, keeping ourselves warm. That, that's not of interest to us today. The next level are safety needs, you know, stopping us from being um, attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, for example. That's not really of interest to us today. The next need is about belongingness and love. Very, very important. Very, very important. important. 
a sense of belonging and love. And the level above that is about esteem. And those two levels, esteem needs and belongingness and love needs, they relate to what Maslow, Abraham Maslow, in 1943, described as psychological needs. The level above that is self-fulfillment, or sometimes referred to as self-actualization. This is about the human being reaching a sense of, if you like, um, enlightenment, a sense of achievement, being comfortable in yourself about who you are and what you do. That's not really that relevant either, but most definitely, if we think about malpractice, malfeasance, misconduct, mis-selling, regulatory failure, corporate governance failure, we can trace it back to the psychological needs that Maslow talked about. And unfortunately, the psychological needs within esteem, belongingness, are at the root of the human behavior that causes the kind of corporate governance failures that are of real concern to all of us. If we think, for example, about the notion of greed, how often have, have how often uh, has it been that organizations have failed from a corporate governance point of view because of greed? And of course, greed is a very complex human emotion that taps directly into what Maslow was writing about way back in 1943. And inevitably, sometimes uh, these issues are very, very problematic indeed. So let me take you to this page. You're looking at a, uh, a web page relating to the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, the United States-based uh, uh, aviation governing body. And it's a web page relating to Boeing 737. You will all be familiar, of course, with the very, very tragic crashes of Boeing 737s. The fact is that these crashes occurred because of an extreme version of corporate governance failures. The crashes did not need to happen. They happened because of corporate governance failures. And to be more specific, they happened because the Federal Aviation Administration became captured by Boeing. The mighty Boeing organization was able to uh, influence the regulatory controls being put in place by the FAA to such an extent that frankly, they were able to bully the regulator into submission and the regulator allowed Boeing to do things Boeing should never have been allowed to do. And this is tragic on many, many levels. Of course, on one level, obviously, the, um, I think 346 people that died, their families, their friends, that is clearly, clearly tragic. I do not need to elaborate on that point. But over and above this, in commercial terms, it has jeopardized the very financial uh, feasibility of Boeing itself. The fines, the costs have been ginormous. I'm absolutely sure that if Boeing had a time machine and could turn back the clock and behave properly as a corporate citizen and not capture the regulator, if they could do that today, they would. And not just to save the lives of 346 people and all their families and friends who were equally impacted, but because it would have been much better commercially to do this. So here I am talking about fundamental human characteristics that lead to behavior centered around issues such as greed. I'm just using greed as one example. And let me tell you where this takes us. It, it takes us to something quite specific. Uh, what you're looking at now, ladies and gentlemen, 
is the groups page of the Transparency Task Force website. We have 25 different groups covering many, many different topics, banking, uh, governance. Uh, they are all built around this very famous Margaret Mead quotation. I hope you can see it. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And, and frankly, if you have any, um, any desire to be part of a force for good, then please, you would be so, so welcome within our community. Now, there is one particular group that we have that is very, very relevant to what we're talking about today. And that is a group called Violation Tracker. And I'm going to explain what Violation Tracker is, what it does, and why it is important for this particular conversation today. Um, as I said earlier, ladies and gentlemen, I will be circulating some slides, and in the slides will be the links to all of the web pages that um, I'm sharing with you today. Now, I'm going to start off with some very, very good news. Violation Tracker is an American uh, database. I stumbled across it last year. I, I found it online and I was so, so impressed with it that I contacted the people at Violation Tracker in the United States, in Washington, DC. And we have had dozens and dozens and dozens of conversations about bringing Violation Tracker initially to the UK. So we, the Transparency Task Force, set up the Globalization of Violation Tracker group. I'm very proud that we did that. We have approximately 85 people in the group and the initial focus is just about bringing Violation Tracker to the UK. However, it is worth mentioning that uh, Better Finance, you recall I mentioned we are associate members of Better Finance, Better Finance are also involved in this project. So I am the chairman of the Violation Tracker UK advisory board and Stefan from Violation Tracker, sorry, Stefan from Better Finance is on that because we are exploring the possibility of not only bringing Violation Tracker to the UK, but also bringing Violation Tracker to Europe. And I'm now going to present Violation Tracker to you. I will click on this part of our website here. Of course, you will be able to do the same when I circulate the links and it will immediately take us to the Violation Tracker website. I hope you immediately understand that the connection between what Violation Tracker is and does and the topic of corporate governance. So allow me to explain. Violation Tracker tracks violations. T to be more precise, it tracks corporate infringements in all there are 483,000 civil and criminal cases from more than 300 US agencies. Okay, US agencies. Allow me to explain what we mean by US agencies. If we click on here, where it says agency data sources, I will just highlight it, I hope you can see. Um, we click on it, and this gives us the list of all the United States agencies where data is gathered, sometimes manually, so much work, sometimes manually, sometimes electronically, to bring the data all inside one super powerful database, as I will show you in a moment. And we are building a list of, I think, 50 agencies in the UK to begin with, where we will be capturing similar data, similar information. So let me show you what we can do with it. It is, it is wonderful. It is wonderful. We can click on this button here, largest penalties, and it will immediately take us to the largest penalties. I am not proud to say that a British company, BP, the oil company, is the single biggest um, um, offender in terms of largest penalties, because as you can see, they're in the oil and gas sector, they were prosecuted for environmental violations in 2015 by DOJ, that's the Department of Justice. The fine was $20.8 billion, $20.8 billion. That is a lot of money, ladies and gentlemen. The second biggest offender is Bank of America, a fine in 2014 of $16.65 billion. Then Volkswagen, I don't need to elaborate, 
JP Morgan, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, quite interestingly, you will see that there are quite a few, quite a few financial services companies in this database. And that is what excited me so much when I found it, because I realized when I was looking at Violation Tracker, I was looking at a transparency machine. I was looking at something that is almost like an MRI scanner for poor corporate conduct, because every one of these infringements represents a corporate governance failure. And if we, if we want to, we can also uh, select from the database by way of, um, excuse me, by way of uh, industry totals. And you can see here, the financial services sector is the worst offender. This does not surprise Christiane, I can see her reaction to that. $331 billion worth of fines since the year 2000. It is enormous. The second place, as you can see, is pharmaceuticals. Only 56 billion. So just to put this into context, I think you have to add up places two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten to equate to the total of the financial services sector. And if you have a particular interest, for example, you may have a particular interest in terms of the environment. You may be somebody who wants to know about the environmental infringements. Well, you can do it. You go to the bit called defense groups, you click on environment, environment related offenses, and it will immediately give you the information pertaining to that. You can do the same with employment rights. You can do the same with all kinds of different things. So the good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that a violation tracker exists in the United States. It is coming to the UK. We are planning to build the UK database probably by about November. And through Better Finance and Stefan and his colleagues, we are hoping one day, as soon as possible, please, for, uh, for a violation tracker to also, come to, uh, to also come to Europe, which I think would be a very good thing, because it is clear to me that the better we can illuminate corporate regulatory failures, the, uh, the better a job we can do. So I'm going to uh, close by basically just saying to you all this. Uh, there is no doubt in my, man, in my mind that when we think about corporate governance, we need to think about the fundamentals of human nature. We need to think about what we were taught by Justice Louis Brandeis, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We need to think about what Darwin taught, taught us about the evolution of the species and how we are all hardwired to survive and because of that uh, we are ha we have a predisposition to put ourselves first uh, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs articulates that very 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 well and I've also shared with you violation tracker which I hope you agree looks like a pretty cool thing to try to bring to Europe um, when I circulate my slides you'll have all of those links please 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 we need support we need contacts um, we want everybody that has an interest in having a, a utility uh, like, like a Violation Tracker coming to Europe to share. So that is it. That is my presentation. Very general, very principles based, very fundamental. I will stop speaking now and pass over to Christiana to take the conversation wherever she would like to take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what a rich uh, and uh, fruitful um, um, presentation you gave on uh, such various aspects. You and what I really, really liked is that um, you you, uh, you mentioned the violation tracker is the high, uh, the highest offender according to the violation tracker is the financial services industry. With that, you close the circle to the very beginning. Um, you started with is the book of Louis Brandeis, um, Other People's Money. And that exactly is one of the reasons why um, the, uh, so many problems occur in the financial services industry, because they're not talking about their own money. They are just dealing with 
other uh, people's money. And where sunlight is the best disinfectant, electric light, he also said, is the best uh, efficient policeman. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> that is uh, in that, uh, indeed very true. I will pick up um, in my presentation, I will, I will try to bring you, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, back to basics, uh, to the ground. It will be hard for you now because um, I am still, I have so many ideas now in my mind after your speech, Andy, um, that it will be a bit difficult, but I will touch upon a couple of your uh, points you made because uh, indeed um, uh, Wirecard is a really good example, well, a good example for, uh, 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 not uh, in, in the literal uh, sense, but it is an example uh, on uh, how corporate governance is needed, how much corporate governance is needed and how much it failed um, and at various lines, how, uh, at the various lines it failed uh, within and outside Wirecard. I have a presentation, um, but I cannot share it myself. I'm a bit uh, behind, but I asked the, um, the host to do that. So I hope uh, the presentation is ready and can be shared. Otherwise, I will do it without a presentation. That's not a problem, but uh, maybe the admin or the host can let me know. No, there is no one. Okay, then uh, we will have to do without the presentation or I can, no, we will have to do it without. Um, you will all have heard about the Wirecard case and had, uh, what happened to one of the 30 largest uh, German companies. It is a case of greed, Andy mentioned that, but it's also a case of vanity and a case of multiple failures of corporate governance. Just to wrap up in short, um, in mid-2020, uh, the company had to admit that 1.9 billion euros were missing from their accounts and had to file insolvency. The CEO is in prison, the COO is on the run, and more than 20 billion euros in shareholder value have been destroyed. And that was to a large part the value of private investors. And all that came despite accounting irregularities that Wirecard had been flagged by the media for many, many years. Despite the fact that accounts had been signed off by the auditor EY and had been approved by the company's board, and despite an investigation by the German watchdog. So fraud may be a lucky strike for some people, for short sellers, for example. It is a nightmare scenario for individual investors and it destroys uh, trust in capital markets. Christoph has pointed to this in his, um, at the beginning and in his presentation. This is a very uh, important economic factor as well. Uh, do we get the slide now? Ah, yes. So if we can move to the next slide, please. If it comes. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much. So to avoid fraud, we have normally various lines of defense. We have the internal audit, we have the supervisory board, and we have the external auditor. In addition, we have some further lines of defense. We have the public supervisory oversight bodies for companies and also for auditors. Um, and in my presentation today, I would like to tell you from my perspective and individual investors perspective, where the first three lines of defense failed, why they failed, how the German legislator reacted, and what still needs to be done to improve the situation for investors in Germany, but also throughout the EU. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, the, the FT started publishing articles about Wirecard already in 2015 and raised questions severe questions about the company's accounting practices and of course it was first of all internal controls role and responsibility to make sure there were enough controls to guarantee the accuracy of the figures and that controls were operating effectively and as intended but the management denied everything even after the major shareholder of the company initiated a special audit by kpmg 
and KPMG released a forensic report in early 2020 in which they raised red flags about Wirecard's accounting for the three prior years, the management still seemed to be in a state of denial, stating oh, none of the accusations, suspicions circulating publicly since uh, January 2019 have been confirmed and no evidence was found for the publicly raised allegations of balance sheet manipulation. That was the official statement after um, uh, a special report by KPMG. Can we, and I know we stay on this slide. When KPMG conducted its review, it was not able to identify 1 billion euros in revenues. 22% of the revenues of that period I have no idea, honestly, no idea how the internal controls, the internal audit could, could have missed something that big. Uh, they should have looked deeply into revenue on an annual basis. That was over the, the 1.9 billion missed cash they had to report mid-2020 was over 60% of the cash holdings. Uh, um, it's an amazing sum. And given that Financial Times started publishing articles already in 2015, I mean, uh, internal audit should have been looking into these accusations, setting up the audit work that provides assurance that financial information is correct and free of any material error. It is, first of all, internal controls role and responsibility to make sure there were enough controls to guarantee the accuracy of the figures. But it was not internal controls that discovered the fraud. So the first line of defense, yeah, it severely failed, obviously. And the question is, what lessons can we draw from the Wirecard case when it comes to internal controls? So on the next slide, we can see, we can take a brief look at the existing legal framework. Um, that's what we have in Germany, but also a bit, I'm looking a bit on, uh, on the European side. So German companies are expected to adopt the risk management system that uh, provides for a thorough and consistent evaluation of the nature and the extent of risks to which they are exposed to, as well as an internal control system that ensures functionality of all essential business processes. And then we have the accounting directive, that is the European one, which requires companies to include in the management report a corporate governance report with a description of the main features uh, of the internal control and risk management systems. Um, the problem is that in Germany, internal controls do not have to be audited. Management up to now only has to install an early warning system, which is part of the risk management system and the internal controls. Only this early warning system has to be audited according to our commercial code. And the audit focuses only on risks threatening the existence of the company, which may be uh, often not uh, that obvious in a first sense, or maybe only in combination with others be really threatening the existence. So it's a quite, from, a, from an investor's perspective, it's quite a um, weak system at this stage. Um, of course, uh, the goal cannot be to avoid fraud in any case. The Wirecat case shows, nevertheless, that this legal basis was not sufficient, is not sufficient, and that we definitely need to strengthen internal controls. So on the next slide, you will see um, the reaction, a few um, points of reaction from the German legislator. Uh, we will, um, I will quickly uh, switch to, uh, through this. Um, we, uh, the, we will have to have in future an appropriate and effective internal control and risk management system within listed companies. Um, it will be much wider than we have before. It will not only relate to an early warning system, but it will um, cover, cover um, uh, the risk bearing capacity of company, risk aggregation, risk response measures, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there is a bit of action going on, um, which is very important. And um, for one reason that is not, maybe not directly linked to corporate governance, but it's the COVID pandemic. pandemic. Uh, the three elements required for fraud to occur, that is pressure, that is opportunity, and that's rationalization. 
they have been heightened significantly by the COVID pandemic. So organizations really need to update their controls to meet all of the, th the challenges thrown at them since 2020 and test them accordingly. What also is important for, from an investor's perspective is that the auditor needs to audit the corporate governance declaration. Christoph has uh, spoken about it earlier in his presentation. In Germany, it's not necessary. Um, so why is it not yet being audited? It will come at some point, um, uh, but it is uh, not yet there. I think it is more important to go now to the corporate governance side. That's why we're here for. Um, here in Germany, and that's on the next slide, um, in Germany, the supervisory board is in the focus. Uh, Germany has, like Poland, I understand, a two-tier board system where the management is responsible for the daily business and the super board, uh, supervisory board is uh, responsible for overseeing management board decisions. Um, so two aspects that a supervisory board is able to perform its tasks properly is um, to, uh, the two elements are the composition of the board and the information flow uh, to the boards. Both elements from my perspective are extremely key. Yep. And if we take a look at this exactly at the composition of the supervisory board uh, it, at the beginning of 2019 from Wirecard, you see, uh, you see one former banker, actually it's now I have uh, done, wait, you see one former banker, you see two management consultants, you see two technology specialists, you see one energy expert. None of them had expertise in leading a large cap company. None of them um, uh, was uh, directly, on the, under, on the other hand, none of them was directly linked to the management, to the major shareholder of the company. So they were all independent, yes, but they lacked expertise. Um, there was, as I said, no former execute, executive of a large cap. Uh, where is the audit expertise? Um, uh, where is um, financial knowledge? We cannot really see it, except maybe for the former banker. So from an outside perspective, it seems that the supervisory board lacked the competency um, and diversity to lead a multinational um, to lead a multinational tech firm. Maybe they have felt inhibited and seriously challenged in management about the assessment and mitigation of key risks, or that's what I suspect, they could not act as a true sparring partner. Mm. On top, um, and until early 2019, the board chose not to create a dedicated committee for audit or for risk and compliance that would have been able to thoroughly discuss key risks. So um, even though the uh, audit directive required this from, uh, from uh, member states, um, Germany had chosen not to transpose this um, um, regulation from the directive and um, let, it, uh, let, it this, uh, what, let the companies themselves decide whether or not they wanted to establish an audit committee or not. And last but not least, the German legal system does not provide supervisory board members with the opportunity to exchange with relevant staff members directly. That's, um, that's what I um, said at the beginning is another very important part in my, uh, in my view, the exchange between the supervisor, the information flow from the, uh, from the company should not be only filtered through management but um, the supervisory board should have the opportunity to directly speak with um, heads of internal controls, heads of risk management, etc. So on the next slide, uh, you will see that uh, our draft law has taken up at least some of the needs I just described. Um, we now will have uh, the requirement to establish an audit committee. Um, uh, the audit committee needs to have two members in future with accounting expertise and uh, auditing expertise, which is uh, very important. Just as today, um, 
the requirements were quite uh, low. The level of expertise required was, uh, was uh, much lower. And the new German draft law will introduce the right for the supervisory board to access critical information independently from management. And the head of the internal control function will in future have to report to the supervisory board on a regular basis. But of course, there's a lot still missing in uh, the uh, draft law. It's a first step forward and it's a good step forward. But um, what is, for example, missing is that the chair of the audit committee must be, should be a financial expert with competence in uh, accounting and auditing. And he should, in addition, be independent from management, major shareholder and the company. Because if you want a real true counterpart for auditors and for internal control, you need to ensure that the chair of the committee, uh, because he's the one who is exchanging most with the auditors, has not only the professional background to counter auditors' arguments, um, but that he's also truly independent. Also missing, it's another point, is that the audit committee should be composed of a majority of independent members to in ensure independent oversight of the matters at stake. If we go to the next slide, uh, we will speak a bit more about the auditors. I want to do that um, and give you a few examples, but I have to see, yes, the impact on uh, external auditor. So in theory, auditors should play a sensitive role. They are expected to look carefully into the books, get an insight into the various corners of a company. An auditor's certificate is something that has authority. It certifies seriousness, it certifies correctness and investors and other stakeholders of why not only, uh, but especially of Wirecard have relied on the audit certificate and they should be able to rely on such an audit certificate. Um, and therefore, also EY, as the company's auditor, is of course under scanner for failing to check Wirecard bank statements for uh, three years. Um, of course, audit breakdowns are not unique uh, to EY. Um, all of the big four firms uh, and also the, the smaller ones have been rocked by scandals. We know all that. Um, the, the US oversight body for auditors, for example, found significantly high failure rates in the most recent figures they have published. Um, their inspectors found that Deloitte and EY got one in five audits wrong. I mean, one in five. Huh? Mm -hmm. PWC almost one in four and KPMG even every second audit. That's, mm -hmm. uh, yes, <laughs> that's the figures from the PCAOB. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. And all four firms had worse records in the latest spots checks than when the PCAOB first began inspecting audits in 2004. So um, there are failures uh, in a huge amount. It's uh, Wirecard is not a single case. Um, the violation tracker uh, shows, um, for, uh, shows uh, that there is a lot of uh, things that go wrong. And the question is what needs to be done to reduce the incidence of audit failures, failures at audit companies. And um, we have seen so many rules that have passed in the US and in Europe that tried over 20 years now to tackle this problem. We have um, the mandatory regular external rotation that has been introduced. We have a restriction on providing certain non-audit fees um, just to make sure that uh, auditors do not become too cozy with management uh, and to eliminate certain conflicts of interest. Uh, and we, we all know that another audit reform is underway in Germany, but also at EU level. So on the next slide, um, uh, you see um, uh, that next to the interesting ideas of a mandatory rotation, which will be introduced for Germany already now after 10 years, and we will get a further separation of non-audit audit services. There are four other points I would like to mention because I think they're very interesting to consider further. The first element is which guarantees that an auditor can properly exercise his or her role is the access to the necessary information. A lack of information easily becomes a lack of control. 
And in the Wirecut case, it is quite obvious that audience, uh, auditors encountered issues in getting required information and data, including from third parties. Um, the problem was in particular acute in regard of the list of customers, access of a bank confirmation or the account statement. The information that should have been provided was of crucial importance to ensure the right accounting treatment and in order to help the auditors to fully, to fully exercise their mission. Um, uh, it, there was a lot of fraud behind the scenes going on at Wirecard, but still this information flow is essential um, for the auditor, unlike in the US, uh, in Germany, we have not a standardized forensic audit. So the auditor is really relying on um, what is uh, being provided by the company. Another idea, which is not new because it exists already in certain member states, for example, in France, is the requirement of a joint audit. Uh, that can have several advantages. Um, two audit firms have to agree on the audit work, on the conclusions. It's more difficult for a company um, uh, for, or for its management or the board to influence two audit firms than one. And it's also interesting, the liability in case of wrongdoing is split into two. This would also improve the reparation prospects of the victims. From my perspective, there's furthermore a need for more accountability of auditors towards the, uh, towards the company's shareholders. Uh, if, you, if you read an auditor's report, it contains standardized phrases that are overall, they are meaningless for investors. You look at it and you just check uh, at the end, does it say it's, uh, it's an unqualified opinion, full stop, then it's fine. But you don't really read it. Even us as uh, shareholder representatives, um, yes, we read it, of course, uh, but it's quite boring. And uh, to many, many, many investors, it is just meaningless. So key audit matters mm -hmm. have improved uh, the situation, but what would be really helpful, and some member states uh, like the Netherlands do that already, um, uh, the auditor has to report to the general meeting. And uh, shareholders can ask uh, the, um, the auditor questions at the general meeting. Um, that uh, enhances accountability and um, is, uh, uh, I think, another small but maybe important piece that could be added. And one of my favorite ideas is not mine, is one from Michel Barnier. It has been stopped uh, by um, uh, in the regulatory process, and most unfortunately, is but we should think really think about eliminating the major conflict of interest an auditor has because we need to make sure <laughs> yeah we need to propose fundamental changes on who pays for the audit uh? mm -hmm. the auditor is being paid by the company um, so this is part of a commercial tendering process um, of course he's responsible First of all, who pays the bill, who decides, that's, that's it. So a scenario where the audit rule is one of a statutory inspection, for example, um, when the appointment, the remuneration, duration of engagement could be, should be, or would be the responsibility of a third party, maybe a regulator rather than the company itself, is really interesting to me. And um, such a concept may be especially relevant for the audit of uh, the financial statements of large companies or systemic financial institutions. So I think it is a really interesting point. Um, uh, as I said, Michel Barnier, the former uh, EU commissioner has tried to um, bring this in the discussion and already in 2010, he failed miserably in the legislative process. But maybe Wirecard has uh, has some good sides, and um, this would uh, is going to be picked up. Um, on the next slide, my last part is um, the question of liability. Um, at the beginning, I said that the Wirecard sc scandal wiped out about twenty billion euros from abused uh, pension savers, investors and uh, showed outrageous failures, not only in corporate governance, but also in public supervision and in external auditing. 
So from the individual perspective, uh, investor's perspective, it is of course extremely important to discuss the question of who pays, who pays when something has gone so utterly wrong at so many levels. And if you look at this picture, uh, I try to bring all the players uh, in that uh, are uh, into this Wirecard scandal and that could maybe could be prone to, prone to liability claims from abused investors from today's perspective. So, and I will guide you to this, uh, through this picture very briefly to show you where the problems are. So we have the company itself, Wirecard. Insolvency proceedings, claims can be filed with the insolvency administrator, but there as an investor, you expect nothing. Huh? There is nothing left, the money is gone. Management board members, one is in prison, one is on the run, as I said, uh, and even though, um, even if you would get them, what can you expect, 20 billion? Impossible. Supervisory board, ah, look at them. Most probably they have made mistakes. Most probably they could be liable, but first nothing to expect from them too, because no, no one of them has enough money to, um, to pay, to compensate all, um, uh, all clients, uh, suppliers, mm -hmm. and in the end, the investors. And it's worse in Germany, there are no direct claims for shareholders under German law. So uh, there is no possibility to sue supervisory board members or management board members directly. It's impossible. You can only uh, sue the company, which then has to sue uh, the respective board members. A complex process doesn't work. Then the auditor. Yes, most probably yes. They have... Uh, uh, provided um, wrong audit certificates, but they have a liability cap, 4 million euro in Germany. Uh, it's, they are ring fenced. It's only German, EY Germany that would be liable, not EY US, not EY Asia, not EY UK or Poland. Uh, it would only be um, EY Germany and a liability cap of 4 million euro does also not help investors. Then we have Bafin, our national supervisor. They could be, uh, they could also be in the game because um, they uh, seem to have protected uh, Wirecard against uh, short sellers, against um, uh, the journalists from uh, from the Financial Times. And you were speaking about regulatory capture, and uh, yes. Uh, it is, uh, it is a, a fair point to mention this, or what we hear now, or, or what we discover now, um, gives a bit the impression there could be a, have been a regulatory capture in, uh, in our case. Um, but in any case, Buffin is legally excluded from liability because they do not act in the interest of individual investors, but only in public interest, or the common consumer interest, I think they call it. So we don't have a, a Buffin does not have a, a clear investor protection mandate. That's not very specific. We, many uh, countries in Europe, uh, in Europe have it, but it is a huge deterrent to a sound investor protection. So next slide. Um, what do we need? Um, we need, uh, first of all, that's it's not really a case for, for Wirecard, but in the case of Volkswagen, for example, it would have helped a lot. We need a direct liability of board members. Um, so we need a safeguard that links responsibility and liability. Um, it's important that board members recognize that when they have done something wrong, they personally will be liable. I think that uh, links well to your, uh, Andy, uh, self uh, how did you say that? Uh, self, uh, selfishness. A bit. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. Um, we we are looking very often to one extent or the other. We are looking at our own position, at our own situation. And if we knew, I mean, me as a lawyer, for example, I have, to, I am liable uh, if I advise my uh, my client wrongly. Um, and uh, why should a board member not be liable in such a case? Uh, of course, in Wirecard case, it would not have helped much, 
Um, but um, it invites, uh, in my view, policymakers to consider whether more emphasis should be put on the personal responsibility of board members. And next to a direct liability um, uh, of board members, I think there is a need to change the liability regime for the auditors. As I said, 4 million cap um, in, in Germany, um, we will enhance the cap, uh, the cap to what I think 16 million or so for, for listed companies. Um, but even the EU Commission, and they are normally very cautious, um, and I will quote this, the EU Commission has um, uh, pointed out that this level of liability appears not to be commensurate with the cumulative audit fees paid to Wirecard statutory auditor over the tenure of its audit mandate, nor with the losses incurred by investors following a 20 billion reduction in Wirecard's market cap. Further legislative update might consider eliminating or setting appropriate liability caps at EU level. And I think the Commission is perfectly right in their, commission, uh, in their assessment. So next and last slide is um, what we need next to a direct liability claim for shareholders uh, against board members, uh, liability, appropriate liability level for auditors, liability of supervisors. Um, the, one of the major hurdles is that investors um, have no uh, realistic option to, um, to go to court together and have an expert fight in case on their behalf. So that's the collective redress issue. Uh, we have it only in a few countries and uh, that means that investors have to file their claims individually. And I would very much love, um, I make it quite brief here because I see we're running out of time. Um, what I really would like to see is a combination of your violation tracker and um, a, an opportunity for, uh, for investors, for direct investors to uh, collectively uh, go against uh, mismanagement, misconduct and fraud uh, or other behavior that is against uh, good corporate governance or uh, we, we, we used to call it the honorable um, uh, uh, trades, trade person. That's uh, the term that we use in Germany. And I think that's how every businessman should, should act as an honorable businessman. And um, now uh, it, it, we had, and I will finish with that, we had in Germany, um, uh, in, when I was young, uh, a banker was not called a banker, he was called a bankier. Um, and there's only an I in between. Uh, from bankier to banker, but uh, banker is has such a bad perception these days yeah. in Germany. Uh, but bankier was an honorable person, and I think it is necessary to shift back to the honorable businessman or the bankier. Thank you very much, Christian. I've really enjoyed listening to you talk and seeing your slides. Um, uh, they, they really make a strong case, don't they, for the idea of um, independent appointment of the auditor. I think you make a very, very important point in all honesty, in all bluntness. Um, you know, human nature being what it is, the incentives being what they are, the ability for people to create relationships that become too cosy. Um, frankly, this is asking for trouble. And I'm very confident that if somebody said to you, Christiana, please design me a bulletproof corporate governance framework, one of your requirements in your design spec would be, of course, the auditors have to be independently of course. appointed. So I guess this becomes a question, Christiana, which is this. What can, what can we do collectively to support the idea that Michel Barnier had? Uh, what can we do to get some energy behind that? Because... It is the kind of um, reform which is so likely to be so successful, it will meet a lot of resistance. So we have to work together to make it happen because the resistance to successful reform is always strong. Yeah? Yeah, it is definitely. And um, the audit reform was uh, the, the, the last one, um, which was, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, which was uh, so... I would say weakened down 
because the audit firm's lobby is unbelievably strong. strong. It is stronger than the financial industry. It is really strong. But there will be a consultation upcoming. There will be um, work. There is work being done at EU level. And uh, I think it is high time for all, uh, all parties involved, all uh, NGOs, um, uh, all, uh, I think it must be also in the interest of companies, it must be in the interest of everyone except maybe the auditors, um, to, um, to uh, try to make sure that the profession of an auditor is, um, is worshipped more, even more, again. Yeah, yeah. On, on, on that uh, call for action, which I support Port, big time. <laughs> I, I propose we bring the session to a close. Christiana, it's been a real pleasure working alongside you and speaking alongside you. And of course, we had the, the benefit of Christoph's session earlier. Um, I've really enjoyed being part of this. And I'll pass over now, I think, to the host and the admin. I'm pleased that you sent me your slides earlier, Christiana, so I was able to do the slides for you. But I think we should have the host and admin here to bring matters to a close. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Also, a big thank you from my side. Thank you for listening and thank you, Andy, for the uh, really uh, totally interesting exchange. I really enjoyed it a lot and uh, looking forward to further exchanges. Very good. Thank you very much. We'll make sure that happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well